Nathan, I know you've done a lot of uh, freelance over the last uh, recent years. Um, you left DreamWorks to pursue doing freelance and being with your kids a lot more and doing schoolism classes. But then you've also been at a big studio, one of the biggest studios when it comes to animation, DreamWorks, uh, for roughly how many years was it? I was at DreamWorks for 15 years. Wow. So what I wanted to do was ask you, you know, when we're trying to decide on going freelance or working at a big studio, what are the pros and cons of both of them so that we can make a better decision on what we want to do? I think a lot of it, of course, depends on your individual personality. Uh, I can tell what my thinking was about why I did what I did. And uh, if it's helpful for anyone, hopefully uh, it is, because um, I thought when I was going through art school, I went through art school in the early 90s. I, I started college in uh, the late 80s and went to art school, you know, regular college and then art school in the early 90s. And uh, it was looking like I would have probably would have a freelance career. Uh, the big animation boom hadn't happened yet. Uh, luckily, that was on the horizon. But um, early on, uh, that was the thinking. You know, I wanted to do imaginative artwork. I thought I might do book covers and, you know, imaginative work, kind of going along those lines. Well, through art school, I realized that that was a really, really bad idea because I was very serious about art school. Uh, for, for anything I did not do well, at least I can say that I did the very best I could figure out. I worked hard in art school. I was focused. You know, my wife teases me now about, you know, I was totally absent during the 90s school and then starting my career. You know, I uh, never saw Seinfeld uh, during all those years and, and everyone else. You know, it was the talk of, of everyone else. Well, in art school, no matter how hard you work, hour after hour, all-nighters, whatever, the next assignment is always due. And so you, you finish school on Friday, you might even have a Saturday class or not, but your next assignment is due on Monday or it's due on Tuesday and it's Sunday, you know, it's, it's Saturday, you want to go out, but this huge thing is due and you feel like you're behind and then Sunday and you want to take a break, you deserve a break, you desperately need it, but oh my, my gosh, you know, this, this huge and I haven't found a solution for this assignment yet. And you're always ill at ease. It's like you can never rest. And that wore on me and wore on me. And I realized that if I went freelance coming out of school, it would be exactly the same. You know, I've got that big assignment, hopefully for a big client. It's due on Tuesday. I want to have a weekend, but I don't dare because if I blow this, I'll lose that client. And so I work through the weekend and crash, you know, just burn. I knew, you know, I, you'd find me face down in the parking lot, you know, after five years of living like that. I knew I had to go in-house. Well, luckily, a friend of mine uh, got a job at a theme park show design company, and they needed people. And they said, hey, do you know any good painters, good artists? And he recommended me. And this is uh, when I was finishing up school. And so I got that job. I freelanced while I was in school, which was rough. But they offered me full-time work and I just freelanced till school was over and then I went full-time. And that was utterly fantastic. We worked hard and it was a learning curve. I, you know, I, I hadn't specifically studied doing theme park design. So there was a big learning curve in that. Probably worked something like 10 hours a day and, and, and it was rough going. But when I came home, I could forget about it until the next day. And over the weekend, I could do my own artwork and keep going and do something I wanted to do rather than just burn out because that heavy, heavy weight would have always been on my shoulders. So when in-house, I did that and then had an opportunity to show my portfolio at DreamWorks. Uh, the rest is, is history. But we mentioned that I was at DreamWorks for 15 years and I didn't want to go freelance. 
But um, and you mentioned about the kids, and dads can't help but go on and on about their kids. So I, I promise I'm, I'm bringing up my kids not to to brag about how you know cool they are and how cute they are. But um, uh, I've I've twins, and uh, uh, I'm very proud to say my my twins health wise then and now a hundred percent. But we went through a rough patch when my twins were born, and we had a very serious health scare. Now, no, no, don't worry. We're all 100%. Everything turned out absolutely fine. But I needed to be home. I couldn't be off doing the 12-hour days. And so uh, and Blue Sky Studios contacted me, as a matter of fact, and offered me to work from home on some of their projects. I got to work on uh, Rio, Rio 2, Ferdinand, and, and uh, some of their shows. But they, they said, no problem. Work from home. You know, we'd be excited to have you. We need a an experienced painter. We, we like the work you've done at DreamWorks. And so I hadn't planned to leave DreamWorks, but it was definitely the right choice to make. And I thought, oh, you know, when things smooth out, maybe I'll go back or I'll go back in house. Nope. Didn't do it. Not going to do it. Bobby, I'm a different person now. Those 15 years let me learn myself, my, my approach, uh, let me learn what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, and also, frankly, contacts. You know, you develop a lot of contacts. People you work with go off to other studios. Over 15 years, you get to know a lot of people. So I was at a place where uh, I had enough contacts, I had enough experience, I had obligations at home, and so now I'm a freelance artist. And uh, late, I, I still, you know, I've worked for Disney here in L.A. I'm, I'm based in Los Angeles. Uh, and I've worked for Disney. I've been working for Paramount uh, Animation Studios. And uh, the deal is I'm only accepting projects that let me do primarily my work from my home studio. Uh, I go in for meetings, of course, you know, when it's a studio here in town. I go in once or twice a week for meetings, for check-ins, and, and make sure I color correct my work, make sure they look just right on their monitors because uh, you never get an exact perfect match. Uh, so I do go in, but I tell you, um, to work my own schedule, to take a break, go play with the kids, take a nap, work all night, and then be able to sleep during the morning and have meetings in the afternoon, Bobby, I'm not going back. This is It's, it's hard. It's not easy. Uh, it's still the brutal schedule and hours at times, but I'm doing it at home and if it's too brutal, see ya. I'm going to take a 20-minute nap. It's great. <laughs> well, it looks like uh, freelance has kind of broke you like it has me. I don't know if I could do um, the regular hours in-house anymore. Definitely love the freedom. Lots of really good points about freelance. But at the same time, I wanted to bring up the fact that you were saying you've already spent 15 years in-house uh, meeting all sorts of people, really developing contacts and such. So that, of course, must have played a big part into your success as being a freelancer. Because, you know, the other word that a lot of people, a lot of artists use as uh, a word to substitute unemployed is, oh, I'm freelance right now. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, in the way things are now, the opportunity is that it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can find opportunities to work. But uh, if you're not living in L.A. and you're not, you know, right next door and, uh, you know, we have uh, we have DreamWorks, Disney, Sony, Animation, Paramount is the, the big studios and the numerous small studios around here. And so that that helps. But um, people are in places where there aren't local studios that they can drive 30 minutes, you know, 30 minute commute and, and get to. And so those people are in a bit of a pickle for making the contacts, right? And, and that's, I'm sure, what some of what you're referring to is. And I would make the suggestion, um, a lot of us, you know, we're possibly a, a little bit introverted. You know, we, we like our, uh, we like our quiet time. We like our time to focus. And uh, so a, a lot of us, you um, Sometimes it feels like work to be, you know, uh, uh, in a group of people all the time. Other people love it. They thrive on it. And some of us, it starts to weigh a little bit heavy. But I'll say uh, never underestimate the critical importance of networking. 
Uh, because if people know who you are, they've met you, they like you, you know, you come across as a, a, a competent person and maybe even make a positive impression. Uh, people are nice. You know, they'll, they'll even want to help you out. You know, oh, I really I met that person. I really like that person. I saw their portfolio. It looked like pretty solid work, but they seem particularly, you know, uh, delightful to be around. You know, I, I, I heard about a job. I, I'm going to pass it on. I think that person is deserving. And so my recommendation, go, you know, go to the, go to all the conventions, go to the meet and greets, go to the, I don't know, gallery shows, go to the Schoolism Live events. If, if people don't mind me sneaking a little, little plug in there, because Bobby, we specifically, you set up meet and greets where yes, the uh, students can meet the instructors, but they also meet and network with the other students, many of which are professional artists. Yeah, about 70%, a little bit over 70% are professionals. 70%. Okay, and that, uh, it, it, it makes sense, and I didn't realize it was quite that high. And an artist who's not doing that is limiting their opportunity. So we all know we have to do good work. Sometimes we don't realize the importance of having those contacts and having people that you can reach out to when, uh, when as you say, saying the word freelance is the same as saying unemployed. Those contacts can turn you around real fast. Very true. And, you know, for myself, I live in Toronto, so contacts, I really understand that. And I went about it a slightly different way through uh, social media and through, like you said, going to events. But the thing that a lot of people overlook is that I did spend a lot of time going to events, and I still do. You know, uh, uh, early on uh, in, in school and when I was studying, I, I met uh, other artists, other students who were really amazing and, and really amazing artists and amazing people at the same time. And so, of course, those are the people you hope will be your friends and have a camaraderie with. And so we had a little we, we had kind of a group, um, just a group of friends. We had like minded ideas. We wanted, I don't want to say the word fantasy because that makes people think of swords and dragons. And I, I like that too, but maybe I'll use the word imaginative artwork because uh, kind of animation, video game design, it isn't just fantasy, but it is imaginative. Well, uh, at that time, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, uh, it had all been, it had been publishing, you know, like I mentioned, book covers and all of that. And we weren't too sure about that. We kind of saw the... Uh, we saw entertainment art rising on the horizon, and that's what we had an eye towards, and that's not what was being taught and not what was ingrained. And so we were trying to force uh, in our classes, we were trying to force the assignments and exercises to be able to do this imaginative artwork. And we kind of bounced off of each other. I even remember we had a thing going. Um, the group of us, we always would kind of check and see this is pre-digital. We were painting gouache acrylics for illustration work. So we'd come in uh, and we'd put all of our artwork up on the crit rails in in an art class. And uh, we were always looking to see really who had done the best work. And we had an underhanded way of complimenting, you know, which of our buddies had, you know, we kind of had to admit that maybe they had outdone us. So the thing we'd always say, we'd walk up to the, the illustration board with their painting, we'd pick it up and say, this one's yours. And they'd say, yeah, you know, it's mine. And we'd turn around and say, well, you can probably still use the back for something. And uh, that was our way of ribbing each other. But at the same time, it was specifically letting them know, you did the best piece this time, but next time I'm coming for you. So I mentioned one of those people in that group went off and got this job, this theme park show design job. And then when they said, hey, we need people, do you know anybody? He recommended me. I got the job. And then they needed more people. Well, some people out there, uh, many people out there, and, and, and you very well, Bobby, know uh, Armand Baltazar. And he was one of the guys in our group, amazing guy, amazing artist. And uh, we brought him in to this project. Then we brought in Henrik Tam, an extraordinary concept artist, and a couple of other people. And so here was this group. We brought each other in. We, we had a job, you know, after, after studying. And then Armand got hired at DreamWorks. And DreamWorks said, hey, we're, we're looking for painters. Do you know anybody? Armand recommended me. I got to work at DreamWorks. 
And it was this group of people that we, they were our, uh, you know, that, that we had, uh, we had a, a network and a camaraderie and I wouldn't be even close to have had the opportunities that I've had today if I didn't know those people. So uh, it, it's a real reinforcement of uh, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, online connections at the convention, uh, the live events, the live classes, uh, those opportunities are there to meet the people and it's half of the battle. And we've gone over the pros and cons of freelancing and we've definitely touched on kind of like the cons of working in a big studio and things that you are enjoying now uh, doing freelance. But what about the pros? Let's talk about the pros a bit because obviously there's lots of pros to work in a big studio. you got all these other people to learn from and things like that. Can you elaborate on the pros of working on a big, in a big studio? Oh, sure. Let me, uh, let me give the definition of developing a complex. Uh, imagine, <laughs> uh, imagine a building in Los Angeles and there's one floor on that with lots of offices and, you know, a little kitchenette and the coffee, and there's actually, there's a soda machine and everything. Uh, DreamWorks was nice about snacks. And it's the visual development hall where the visual development artists work all on one floor of a building. And so you're sitting in one of those offices, and next door to you is Paula Sain, uh, and then next to that is Dominic Lewis, and then Marcos Mateo Mestre, and Armand Baltazar, and, you know, the, I, I keep you Scott Wills. I probably shouldn't mention any names because the list is very long and I'm not going to be able to name everyone. And then I'm kind of leaving someone out who deserves to be on the list. But, you know, uh, imagine some of your very favorite artists in the world, uh, animation artists. Many of them have at a time worked at DreamWorks. And imagine all of those people being in a hall. And you're supposed to keep up with those people. Oh, my gosh, Bobby. That was, uh, it, it was um, a trial by fire. But the good news is, you know, we peek over their shoulder and uh, see what they're up to. And, and you know, we, we all learned digital together. We started out in the beginning, 1996. When I Streamer started in 95, I came on. Uh, they set up the studio and, and brought on the Prince of Egypt. And so I started in 96. We were painting in acrylics. And then we all transitioned into digital in later, you know, a few years later together. And so you could peek over people. You know, we were inventing digital painting. And that was it's kind of scary, kind of exciting. And uh, you could look over people's shoulders. I, I was kind of stuck. You know, I, I was all about my brush. And, you know, uh, we, we were using, you know, like Intuo style tablets. And so we no longer had the, the contact and the movement. And so I could look over people's shoulders and see how they were solving those problems, you know, and what tools and techniques they were using. But even more than the tools and techniques, you know, seeing the artistic ideas they were using the tools to, to create. And so all these people were influencers. They were inspiration. I learned an incredible amount from them. And once again, uh, if I'd been sitting at home in my home studio trying to like, okay, I'm supposed to take this, you know, I have this pen, I'm supposed to tap it on this tablet, you know, and and do what I used to do, uh, I, I would have been lost. And so there's that, but there's also the production pipeline. You deal with all aspects of the production pipeline in a big studio, even if you're just doing 2D paintings, as I usually do. Uh, you have to deal with uh, Maya, and you have to deal with the modelers, the texture artists, surfacers, the 3D lighters, uh, the storyboard artists, the animators, all of those things. You learn about those things. You learn about what those people do. You learn about the technology that they use that you have to interface with. You cannot get that, not all of it, working at your home studio. And so I strongly recommend it's not for everyone. I've seen people who start out freelance, stay freelance, and it seems to have been the right choice for them. But for the rest of us, I strongly recommend starting out. Um, it's great if you can jump into uh, a big studio, but times were different then. Things are a little bit more. Uh, things are a little bit more uh, uh, compartmentalized. Uh, if someone can start at a small studio, 
work with people, work with the technology, get the lay of the land and move up from there. I strongly recommend making and taking that route until you're ready to go the freelance route. That's a very interesting point and really good logic behind all of it. I didn't go that way, right? I started, like you were saying, at home, just me and Kay, and we're trying to figure things out. And like, how do you do this? How would you, how did they do that? You know, and and uh, that was one of the big driving forces behind creating schoolism in the first place, because I wanted to learn how all those people did all those things. So, if there are people out there in those kind of situations. At least now there are options for them to still learn from all these great artists. And now you can learn from all these great artists in various studios through uh, things like schoolism. Um, so there are, there are opportunities out there now, uh, especially with the rise of the internet and everything. Yeah, well, that's the whole point, right? Right, Bobby? Um... In the market now, I remember some, at Dream, when we started at DreamWorks, we had a two-month training period where we were all training on how to, you know, painting for the Prince of Egypt led by Paula Singh. And we had time to warm up and practice and get in the groove. That doesn't exist anymore, usually not. Uh, you get a job and you come in and you have to hit the ground running. You have to know the, the tools and the tech. You, you, of course, you have to know the artistry first, but you also have to know the tools and the techniques uh now and so we went through that in period where it was being invented there were no online tutorials about how to do it back in the late 90s when we were doing this and so that's the whole point for uh what you've done and what i've uh, tried my best to do in my schoolism classes is to create uh to put it out there you know uh, uh i didn't know how to do it and, and here's what i figured out and this is how it worked. And so we're putting it out there uh, online so that people can get that experience. And then they can come into a studio, hit the ground running, pretend like they're already a pro because, you know, they've, they've learned from, uh, had a chance to learn from some professionals. Hey, everybody, Nathan Fowkes here. And I am so excited to finally take my on-site landscape sketching class that I've been teaching for many years and bring it online to schoolism.com. So now we can do this together from anywhere in the world. And I've been at this for the past 20 years, taking my sketchbook and my paint kit with me everywhere I go and recording the magic of the landscape, the experiences that I've had in my sketchbook with watercolors and with gouache, and so in this course, I'll go through with you setting up your materials, setting up your kit to make sketching fun and convenient for you. I'll go through all the recommended materials, but also leave it open for you to make the class your own and to use the materials that you find that you enjoy the most for on-site landscape sketching. We'll go through sketching with limited palettes and very advanced palettes. I'll take you through the tools and techniques that let you step by step, very clearly, very simply, put together the scenes that inspire you to take a moment in time and to make it last forever. But we will not be learning any formulas in this class. Rather, we'll learn the tools and techniques that let you tackle any scene at any time of day or night, at any season, and in any place in the world. Each week, you'll go to the convenient Schoolism page online. You'll watch the recorded lesson where I go through the principles for tackling the complexity of the landscape and bringing it with meaning to the page. And included with each lesson are three full demonstrations. Demonstrations that pick different places in the world, different times of day, different challenges and different complexities to help you capture whatever landscape you choose to tackle. There are nearly 30 demonstrations in all in this course. At the end of each week, you'll upload a page of your studies to the Schoolism website where I'll do a careful review and critique where I talk you through the process as you see me paint over your work 
to make corrections. Each lecture in the course will give you the practical knowledge and the experience to understand what you're seeing and how to interpret it. We'll take scenes of great complexity and learn how we can break them down into manageable paintings that take one hour or less in most cases. I'll give you ideas for interpreting a scene, finding inspiration within it, and what inspires you about the landscape. We'll tackle the complexities of color so that you're better able to interpret what you see and to use your medium and to mix your paint to capture the immediacy of each moment. An important part of my career as an artist has been work in animation art, and I've been called on over and over to find inspiration in the landscape, to take different places and different stories and bring a compelling sense of believability to those scenes. And my friends, I have to tell you that none of this would have been possible without the hours and the days weeks, months, and years of studying the landscape, learning about light and atmosphere on the land. Sketching on location and capturing the immediacy of the landscape will inform everything that you do as an artist. I'll see you at schoolism.com.